Thank you, Catherine. Wow. Well, you want to turn in your Bibles and let's get into the Word of God. Are y'all ready tonight? You know, um, I want to talk to you. You can turn to Psalm 25 if you'd like to. And I want to talk to you tonight about you are made for more. That's the title of my book. And I'm going to share my story with you tonight because I just want to remind you that with God's help, you can overcome anything you're facing tonight. I don't know if you heard my daughter, but she went through depression. She went through uh, suicidal thoughts at one time in her life. She struggled, but she is completely free today. And no matter what you're going through, God can help you overcome. Amen. And you've got to know that. You've got to understand that God made you for victory and not defeat. You know, he wired you for victory. The Bible says in uh, Proverbs 2, 7, it says, God holds victory in store for you. You see, God, uh, victory is your God-given spiritual DNA. It doesn't mean we don't go through things. It just means that God wired you. It's your spiritual DNA to come out in victory, to be an overcomer. Amen? And so you are wired for victory. And what you may be going through things right now, but I want to tell you something that someone told me one time my dad said to me when I was going through such a, a dark tunnel in my life. He said, listen, what you're going through is temporary, but God's word is eternal. And really, that's what the word of God says. It says in 2 Corinthians 4, 18, don't focus on the things that are seen, but on the things that are not seen. For the things that you see are temporary, but God's word is eternal. Amen. And we stand on God's word. And you know, I know that sometimes, because I've had this kind of attitude, we have the attitude, well, if I can just make it through this trial alive, I'll be glad. Have you ever thought that way? But you know what? God, what? God made you not just to survive trials, but to thrive through them, to come out in victory. And he doesn't want you just to barely make it, barely get along. He wants you to be an overcomer. Amen. You are more than a conqueror. You can overcome through Christ who strengthens you. You know, I, I want to really get that into your spirit tonight because you can overcome whatever you're going through. It's not impossible for God, and he wants you to walk in that victory. But I want to read a scripture to you in Psalm 25. Psalm 25, verse 1 through 3. And it says this is Psalm of David. It says, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you I trust, O my God, do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one whose hope is in you will ever be disappointed. Look at verse 15. But my eyes are ever on the Lord, for only he will release my feet from the snare. This is what God put in my spirit tonight, that God wants to, to release you from some things tonight. He wants to release you from hurts. He wants to release you from the pain of the past. He wants to release you from uh, a broken heart. He wants to release you from wrong thinking. God wants to bring release into your life. If you receive that, say amen. amen. Catherine, I wish you would bring me, just because this is slant and I'm having a hard time reading my notes, maybe another Bible. Can I borrow somebody's Bible that can lift my notes up for me a little bit? Thank you, thank you, Cheryl. I so appreciate that. Is that okay? I got to get all worked, get it all working here. <laughs> this, this scripture says, no matter what you're going through, number one, keep your eyes on Jesus. That's the number one key. Let me tell you, I've been serving the Lord since I was three years old. I prayed the salvation prayer, and it took when I was three years old. And I can tell you that God has always been faithful to me. But you got to stick with Jesus. When you're in trouble, that's not the time to run away from church, to run away from God, or to blame God. you got to stick with Jesus. Amen. And this scripture says, if you'll keep your trust in him, you will never be disappointed in what he does for you. Now you say, well, that, does that mean he's going to do exactly what I ask him to do? No, no, it doesn't mean that. Thank God he doesn't answer some of our prayers. Amen. Have you ever prayed a prayer and you look back on it and say, God, I'm so glad you didn't answer that prayer. But it simply means no matter what comes into your life, if you will keep your eyes on Jesus, if you will keep your trust in him, he will see you through and he will take what seems meaningless and make it into a message for other people. Amen. He will turn it around for your purpose and for your destiny. Amen. 
I found that to be so true in my life. And let me just share some things that have happened to me. You know, I was born as a baby with uh, a crippling disease similar to cerebral palsy. And the doctors told my parents that I would probably never walk or talk, that I would be in a wheelchair for the rest of my life, and that my parents just had to make up their mind to, you know, that they were going to have to take care of me the rest of their life. And I had an absolute no muscle tone in my body. I couldn't move my limbs. I couldn't lift my head like my two-year-old baby son did it. A two-week-old baby son lifted his head. I couldn't do that for months. I couldn't move anything. My mom had to take like 45 minutes to try to get formula down me because I had no sucking reflexes. And it was a, it was a hard time uh, uh, for my parents at that time. And my father was the pastor of a, a denominational church. And he loved God. He got people saved all the time. And uh, he had been taught that God didn't heal anymore. He had been taught that the day of miracles was over. But you know what? When my parents were faced with my situation, I'm so glad my parents began to, and my dad began to seek God for himself. And he, he decided to take off his religious glasses. He decided to take off his traditional glasses and he began to open the word of God and God began to reveal himself to my dad. And as he read the, the uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he began to see the real Jesus, amen. The real Jesus loved people, healed people, and did miracles wherever he went. And my dad learned through reading the Bible that God is a good God, He's a good God, people. He is a good God. And my dad learned that he's a good God and that Satan is the one who puts us in bondage. And when my dad got to Hebrews 13, 8, that says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, something clicked inside of him. And he and my mom decided that they were going to pray for me and believe God for a miracle. And in their childlike faith, they said, God, if you healed in the Bible, you can heal our daughter today. And you know, it didn't happen overnight, but within the next few months, I began to lift my head, and I began to move my arms, and my muscles began to work. I say, that's why I'm so buff today. Not really. I'm just kidding. But anyway, I, I began to act like a normal baby, and you know, by the time I was one year old, I was completely healed. It's such an amazing miracle that God healed me. He did a miracle for me. I would go back every year to my, uh, my pediatrician, and every time she saw me, she would say, there's the miracle girl. There's the miracle girl, because she knew what a miracle it was. You know, my, my parents found out that there never was a day of miracles, but we serve a God of miracles. And I want you to know we serve a God of miracles. We serve a God of healing and deliverance, and he can heal you everywhere you hurt. Amen. And that's when my parents founded Lakewood Church, and, um, and it was a, they wanted a church that believed in miracles, a church that believed in the power of the Holy Spirit. It was life-changing for my parents. And I guess, I guess y'all know I'm from Lakewood Church. I'm, Joel Osteen is my brother. John Osteen, I, I relate with uh, Anthony. I used to be John Osteen's daughter. Now I'm Joel Osteen's sister. But you know what? I don't care. I'm just glad I'm in a great family. And, and, but anyway, God just, uh, start, I mean, my parents just believed God and started Lakewood in 19, uh, well, way back then. And, and he, <laughs> no, you're going to say that. And uh, in a feed store with 90 people. And that church now has grown to, we meet in the com former compact center. We have a, a sanctuary of 16,000 people today. And so it continues to be a place where people receive miracles and healings. And God is so good, isn't he? But this is the truth I want to share with you. Don't let anyone tell you what God cannot do in your life. It's so important. Listen, sometimes we have to let go of what others have taught us if it doesn't agree with the word of God. Because you know people mean well, but did you know they can only teach you what they know and sometimes they don't know the full truth. And you can read the Bible for yourself and God will speak to you because he loves you and he will reveal himself to you. Just like he did with my father. He began to reveal himself to him. You know, I, I just think about this, but one time when my parents first came into all of this that someone told my mother, uh, said, you can't be holy and wear makeup at the same time and so you know she just didn't know any better you know this was all new to her and so she took off her makeup and that lasted three days because my dad said Dodie put your makeup back on please 
But I say that to tell you, religion sometimes is about man-made rules. But Christianity is about a real and personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And your heavenly Father. And sometimes you have to let go of tradition in order to take hold of God's full word. Amen? Don't let anyone tell you what God cannot do in your life. Don't let anyone tell you that God cannot bring your dreams and desires to pass. Don't let anyone tell you that God is not going to save that loved one. Amen? God is a faithful God. He's a faithful God. My dad said to me one time, he said, this was years ago when I worked with him in the office. He said, Lisa, Satan has fought you since you were a baby. But he said, that only tells me one thing. God must have big plans for your life. And I've never forgotten that he said that. And I want to say it to you. You may be going through some big things right now, but that is only an indicator that God has big plans for your life. Amen. Say big plans. You see, God created you on purpose and for a purpose. And it's not just to survive in life. It's not just to barely get along. It's time to rise up and believe what God says about you. Amen. Jesus said in John 10.10, he said, the thief comes into your life to steal, kill, and destroy. But I've come. Don't get me mixed up with Satan. I've come that you might have abundant life. The Bible teaches us that God has a wonderful plan for our lives. And I'm so glad that we know that. We're strong in that in the body of Christ. But I think that many times we have to realize that we also have an enemy. And he has a plan for our lives. And he is very, Satan is very strategic, and he wants to keep you from God's wonderful plan. And so you have to realize if it's not good, then it's not God. Amen? And don't blame God for what the enemy is doing in your life. You have to resist Satan in the name of Jesus. You have to say, no, I choose God's plan for my life. Do you know I'm, I, I've been serving the Lord all since I was a little girl, and I always have to say no to the enemy. You know, you never get over that. Because Satan will come with thoughts. He will come with his plan. And you have to get to the place where you just, your automatic reaction is, no, Satan, I choose God's plan. I'm going to live in my purpose and my destiny. You know, it's like our old German shepherd that we used to have growing up. His name was Scooter. And uh, he was a great dog. And he was like the king of the hill in our neighborhood. And my dad was so proud of that dog. And you know how a man and his dog is, you know. And he was so proud of him. And he would take him on walks or bicycle rides. And, and Scooter would just, you know, prance along with him. And he was so proud of him. And every time they got to the corner of our, our block, you know, there was this cat. And Scooter would see this cat. And he would, he would hightail it after that cat. And, and that cat would barely make it up the tree. And my dad was so proud of him because he just thought, you know, Scooter's going to get that cat one day. You know, he's going to, he, that's going to be a dead cat one day. That's what my dad was thinking. And so uh, anyway, one day something did happen. Just like uh, every other day, Scooter saw that cat and he began to run after that cat. Well, this time the cat didn't move. This time he rose up on his hind legs and put his claws out like he was about to attack our big German shepherd dog. And you know what Scooter did? He made a rapid U-turn and ran away from that cat. It was that day we realized that that cat must have been going to Lakewood Church. <laughs> he found out who he was in Christ. He was made for more. Okay, I'm, I'm going to stop there. But what happened? The cat got fed up being tormented with, with Scooter. He got fed up being tormented by Scooter. And he took a stand against him. And I want to ask you a question. When are you going to take a stand against Satan? When are you going to say no to Satan? Because he has absolutely no power over you. Amen. Amen. Jesus said, I give you power over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. There's an interesting scripture in Genesis 27, 40, and it says this. It says, when you decide, now listen to this, when you decide to break free, you will break the yoke from your neck. There comes a time in life where you have to make the decision, I'm breaking free from this cycle. I'm breaking free from this addiction. I'm breaking free from this shame mentality. I'm breaking free from these wrong thoughts. When you decide that's when you will break through. Amen. That's good. Sometimes we are waiting on God, but he is waiting on us to use our God-given authority. 
He's not going to do for you what he wants you to do. He's already defeated the enemy. And he said, I've given you power over all the power of the enemy. Now use your authority. You bear my name. When those negative thoughts come, like Caroline Leaf talked about last night, you say, I resist those thoughts in the name of Jesus. You, I resist you, Satan. When oppression comes, when depression comes on you, you rise up and you say, I resist that in the name of Jesus. And you begin to worship God and change the atmosphere around you. Walking in your authority. Don't settle for anything less than God's best for your life. In 1990, I went through something else. I'm just giving you a few snapshots of my life. and I tell the whole stories in detail in my book. have a lot of good teaching in there. But in 1990, I went through something that I never dreamed I would go through. It was my job to open my parents' mail. I'd open their, uh, their personal mail. And they received gifts and Bibles and back then uh, audio tapes and things like that from people all the time. And, and uh, so when I went into my office on January 30th, you know, I, put, I saw this unusual package like this. It was like a, a brown paper, uh, a brown cardboard box. And it was addressed to my dad. Uh, J-O. And so I, I thought it was a gift from my parents, but what I didn't realize is that I was about to open a mail bomb. And someone had sent my dad, and we don't know why because he wasn't very controversial. He was on TV. He was a wonderful man of God, but they sent him a mail bomb, but I was about to open it. And I picked it up three times and put it back down. It was heavy. I, I, it, it shook. And I think I just was hesitant to open it, probably because the Holy Spirit in me. But anyway, I, I put it down. I sat down in my office. I put it down like this way across my legs. And I tore off the paper. And I opened one piece of tape. And it exploded all over me. And I'll never forget because during that time it was so loud. It was just so loud. And I, I thought I was dying. And I, I even said to the Lord, I think this is awesome because when you know Jesus, you don't have to be afraid of death. And immediately, the first thing I did is said to the Lord, I talked to the Lord. And I said, God, am I dying? And then I asked him one other question. I said, is this death? And when I asked him those questions, I came to my senses. I was standing about five feet away from my desk. I don't even know how I got there. I was shaking profusely. My ears were ringing so loud. And I looked down and I had on a leather skirt, with, with, which, the, uh, the, a leather skirt which the paramedics said pro actually helped protect me that day. But I was just smoldering like I had been on fire. I was able to run out and get help. But to make a long story short, that mail bomb, it was a pipe bomb. It had 10-inch nails in it. It had shrapnel in it. I have some of that shrapnel that's still in my body. It, it, it knocked a hole in my leg right here, and I have an indention there. It knocked three holes in my abdomen. But listen, this is a miracle. It never touched my face. It never touched my heart. It just hit me in those two places. And, and, and I'll never forget the paramedic on, on uh, duty that day. He said to my dad, he said, Pastor Osteen, someone had to be standing between your daughter and that bomb. And, of course, we know it was the Lord Jesus Christ. It was an angel of God. God. Angels are all around us. It was another great miracle, just a great miracle. In fact, the story went all over CNN headline news, and I loved it because, you know, they talk about the spin room. Well, they wanted to spin everything negative. You know, nobody's going to want to come to your church. This puts fear on people. But my dad, he just said, no, we're not afraid. God de delivered our daughter, and he'll do it again if he has to. And he was always saying, God, we give God the glory. So God, we, we were able to give God glory through all of that. It's amazing. And so now I say Satan tried to destroy me with a bomb, but I am the bomb, you know. So <laughs> I own that. I own that. I earned it. <laughs> Thank God. I was in the hospital for 13 days. Actually, I wasn't. I didn't really have terrible injuries, to tell you the truth. It's amazing. And uh, they just sewed me up. I, it took a little while for me to recover. And it was just such a great miracle. And and so, um, anyway, after that, you know, I could have allowed that tragedy to change me. It was a deciding point in my life because I, I could have been consumed with fear. Believe me, fear came against me fiercely after that. And uh, I, I get the post-traumatic stress syndrome because I had 
horrible thoughts and just the, the remembrance of it all. But, you know, I had the Word of God in me. And, you know, I knew that I was made for more than being a victim. I was not going to see myself as a victim, but as a victor. And, and when fear told me not to go to work and fear told me not to get in the car, I just did it anyway. I just decided that I was going to do whatever I did on, on a normal basis. And within two weeks, I walked out of that, that horrible time of fear, and God completely delivered me. And I never think about it anymore except to give God all the glory because he's so good. He's so good. Amen. If you'll trust God, if you will stick with him, no matter what you go through, his plans will always prevail. Proverbs 21.30 says, There's no wisdom inside or plan that can succeed against the Lord. God promised to release your feet. He released my feet from the snare. The last thing I want to mention to you is something, a personal thing that I didn't talk about for so long, but uh, when I graduated from college, I thought I married the man of my dreams. And I dreamed of being a pastor's wife like my parents. I wanted to have a lot of kids. And I married a pastor, but how many of you know sometimes things don't turn out as we plan? And uh, about two years into that marriage, my ex-husband began to change and make strange decisions. And he sort of deceived me into going home to see my family for a while. And I didn't understand it, but he sent me divorce papers in the mail. And it was such a devastating time for me. I mean, I, I couldn't believe it. I, to this day, I've never had closure. I've never talked to him. I tried over and over, but you know, this is in the past, but at that time, I tried over and over and really have had no closure on that. But I tell you what, I've had a healing from that for sure. But uh, I, you can imagine, I had to go back home to my childhood home. I was so devastated and discouraged. I felt like I was disqualified from ministry. And, you know, already I was, I was a woman having a desire to be in ministry. And now I'm a divorced woman having to be in ministry, wanting to be in ministry. And so I felt disqualified. And I really felt like my life was over. But I'm so glad that God doesn't think that way. He doesn't think that way. He is such a good God, and he's such a redeemer and a restorer. Amen. And let me just fast forward to the present real quick because God healed my broken heart. He restored my life again. He gave me a new and improved husband this time. Yeah, Kevin and I have been married 26 years next month. Yes, and wait, that's not all. When we couldn't have children, he blessed us with three beautiful children. Caroline, Catherine has a twin, and then we have a 15-year-old son. So I have two girls in college. Y'all pray for me, please. I miss them so bad. I was so glad when Catherine was able to come here. But anyway, you know, uh, just when you think your life is over, it's like that's the time that God invades your life and says, bam, this is where I do my best work. He's such a master. He's such a master builder. He is our architect and the Bible says he is the author and finisher of our faith and you can trust Jesus no matter what you're going through when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death I've been there but God's been with me and he's brought me out and he will bring you out Psalm 130 verse 7 says this with the Lord there is full redemption full redemption my ex-husband he thought he'd kick me out but he just kicked me up into my destiny that's all I can say Amen. This is the second truth I want to leave with you. Don't allow a moment to become a lifetime. So important. I almost got stuck in that moment. So too many times we get stuck in a moment. And it's okay if you're stuck, but you're going to get unstuck tonight. Because I was there, I have to admit that I got stuck in self-pity. And I was feeling sorry for myself because what had happened. I had been this, serving the Lord since I was a little girl, and I could not understand why this had happened to me. God, this is what I was thinking. God, all I wanted to do was serve you. All I wanted to do was to be in the ministry. All I wanted to do was just read your word. And now, how could this happen? And I kept pushing the rewind button and, and replaying the situation over and over, and it almost drove me crazy. You know what? When we're, sometimes when we're pushing the rewind button, we need to stop and start pushing the delete button, amen? And start deleting those thoughts and stop tormenting ourselves. Sometimes we don't even need the enemy to torment us because we torment ourselves because we want to know why. Women especially want to know why, don't we? 
We want to know why. But sometimes we got to give God the whys. Sometimes we will never know why. And you know what? That's okay as long as God has got control of your life. Amen? The Bible says that God reveals the secret things to his people. If he doesn't reveal something to you, it's for a reason. I believe he is protecting you. He is protecting me. So the secret things belong to God. I don't know how I got off of that. But listen, God doesn't want you questioning and tormenting yourself. Push the delete button. Amen. The truth is what I learned at an early age, in my early 20s, that John 16, says, In this life you will have tribulation, but be, you will have trials, distress, and frustration, but be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. You see, God never said that we wouldn't have problems, but he said, because I overcame, you will overcome. Because I overcame, I will help you overcome. Amen. That's preaching material right now. <laughs> Woo, God is a good God. Somebody has that in their thinking tonight. You've been taught that God punishes you, that God makes you sick, that God does these things to you. God is not that kind of a God. God is a good God. I don't know why I keep saying that, but some of you need to take hold of that, that God is a good God and he loves you just the way you are and he has purpose and destiny for you. Amen? Amen. You know, after six weeks of staying home and crying all the time, I wouldn't even go to church, ladies, because I was too embarrassed to go to church to admit that my husband had uh, sent me divorce papers in the mail. And after six weeks of just crying and staying at home and hardly eating because I was so depressed, um, I called my dad like I did many times. He was at the office, and uh, I said to him crying, Daddy, I think I'm having a nervous breakdown. And he said to me, no, Lisa, you're not having a nervous breakdown. And I just stopped him in his tracks, and I said, no, I am having a nervous breakdown right now. And he didn't know what to think. He, he had encouraged me so much, but I was so bad. And so he said, hold on a minute. There's somebody, somebody here that wants to talk to you. Well, it was Dr. T.L. Osborne. I don't know if many of y'all remember him, but he's in heaven now, a great missionary statesman for God. And he, he loved our family. We loved him. And he was just visiting my dad that day. And, and so he said to me, he said, Lisa, can I talk to you and encourage you? And I said, yes, you can. And he said, you know, I love you like a father. And can I talk to you like a father? And I said, yes, you can. You know, I was just crying and crying. And, and he, said, he said, you know what, Lisa, you want to know why you're crying? And I was just on the edge of my seat thinking this is my answer. And he said, it's because you're feeling sorry for yourself. I thought, is there anybody else I could talk to over there? Because this is not what I wanted. This great man of God telling me I felt sorry for myself. Did he know I went through a divorce? <laughs> you know. But you know what he did? You know, the Bible says the wounds of a friend bring healing. He was bringing healing to me. He was speaking the truth to me in love. And he went on to say, I mean, I dried my tears after that. He shook, he shook the, the slack out of me. And, and he said, Lisa, you know, I know what it's like to lose someone. He lost his son. I know what it's like to hurt. And he said, I know you're hurting. But he said, let me tell you something, Lisa. Your life is not over. And he said, God has a plan for your life. And he said, it's time for you to quit crying. It's time for you to stand up straight, stand up tall. Put your shoulders back is what he told me. Hold your head up high again. He said, and God will take this scar in your life and he will make it a star for him. And that brought such healing to me. You see, sometimes we need somebody just to speak the truth to us. I was just wallowing in self-pity, but that day I got free. It was a turning point for my life. And, and I, I know now if I would have stayed at home and just obsessed over my situation, I would have never fulfilled my destiny. I would have just continued to spiral down in depression. And you know what? That was Satan's plan for my life. You see, I talked about God's plan and Satan's plan. See, these are defining moments when you have to realize, okay, what am I going to do? Do what Satan would like me to do or stand up with God's help and fulfill my destiny? So I, I had been avoiding church, and after that happened, it, it just put a little bit of a spring in my step, but I had been avoiding church. And my dad finally said to me, he said, Lisa, you need to come back to church. Just forget it. He said, he said, you just need to come back and let me tell the people what you're going through. Well, I don't recommend this to anybody else or any other pastors. But it was just, it was just right for us. 
And because we're just real transparent, real, we're, we're real open. And, and uh, we had about 4,000 people in the church at that time in a service. And, and uh, my dad said to me something that set me free. Coming from a pastor and my father, he said, Lisa, we're human like everybody else. He said, we hurt like everybody else. And he said, for years and years, we have prayed and stood with the people in our church. And now it's time for them to stand with us. And wow, you talk about shaking the shame off of me. And the disappointment I, that I felt I was to people. And when he said that, I just, I got a little taller. And we went to church and he just simply said, people, my daughter's going through something. Her husband sent her home. He's divorcing her. She's hurting. She needs help. We need help. We need prayer. And do you know, it was as simple as that. And like 20 or 30 people just ran down to the altar where I was standing, like right where Catherine is. And they just began to hug on, hug on me. Excuse me. They began to love on me. And right there, the, uh, the whole church just prayed for me. And you know what? I, I realized that Satan was trying to isolate me. He was trying to keep me in my self-pity, keep me away from church, keep me in that shame and condemnation. But when I came out and I realized, hey, this is what the body of Christ is all about. You know, this is what we need. We need each other, like Dr. Caroline Lee talked about last night. We need to pray for each other. We don't need to condemn each other, but we just need to love each other through the trials of life. Amen? You know, my dad used to say this often. He said, the church is not a museum to display perfect people, but it's a hospital for the hurting. It's a place where we can run and receive help. Amen. And I just encourage you that if you're going through something, listen, don't run, but let, let a prayer partner know. Let one of your leaders know. Let your pastors know that you're going through a hard time and let them stand with you through the trials of life. I mean, do you know what it did for me as I walked through that church? I began to work at the church at that time, and I would I just walk through the church, and people would say, praying for you, Lisa. You doing okay, Lisa? Praying for you. They didn't get nosy. They just said, I'm praying for you. That just brought strength to me. And, I, you know, it makes me realize, I, I, I think during that time, I, I really realized and understood why people backslide and why people get out of the church when they're hurting or when they've gone through something like that or maybe when they sin because they feel ashamed. They don't feel like they measure up. But we've got to welcome them with open arms. Amen. And I just encourage you, if you know any prodigals, go after the prodigals. If you know people that aren't in church and they should be in church, call them and get them back in church. Let them know you will love them. Amen. Do you know something else happened during that time that was really life-changing? And after that service, a, a man and a woman, they were not married, but they were going through separations. They came up to me after the service and said, Lisa, would you pray for me? Would you pray for us? We're going through divorces. We're going through separations. We want our, our marriage to work. I mean, literally, I couldn't believe it. I thought, are you kidding me? I need prayer. Did you just, did you just hear my dad? <laughs> I'm going through a divorce. You think my prayers are going to work for you? <laughs> That's what I was thinking, but you know what? I, I didn't say, I was thinking it, but I didn't say it, and I just reached out, and I grabbed their hands, and I began to pray for them. Every time after the service, after that, people would come up to me and say, I'm going through the same thing. Please pray for me. They talked me in to having a weekly prayer meeting, and so I started praying with them every week, and then I realized that they were discouraged, and they needed the Word, and they didn't have the Word like I'd been taught, so I started teaching them the Word of God. I started saying, this is what God is showing me. Well, during all that time, Every week, I was praying for other people. I was teaching the Word of God, and because of that, I began to get strong in my spirit. I began to get my mind off myself and my mind onto other people, amen? And strength came into me. It was amazing. See, when I got my mind off of myself and onto other people, I became strong again. Dr. Caroline Lee said it so powerful last night. If you think you're going uh, you're gonna to have to be perfect before you ever touch somebody's life, you're going to wait forever. The best thing you can do in the midst of your struggle is to get up and pray for someone else. Call someone else. Go get involved in a prayer meeting. Do whatever you can, but don't sit at home and wallow in self-pity. 
Don't sit at home and think about your situation. Get your mind off the situation and start giving out to other people. Amen. You listen, I actually learned to preach in the worst trial of my life. You see, as I was out there just teaching the people the Word of God, I didn't realize that God was stirring up a teaching gift inside of me. I had always had a love for the Word of God. I always thought I was going to be just, I was going to be a pastor's wife. But little did I know that God was going to place the teaching gift in me. And so as I was teaching those people, that gift began to develop. And one day my dad noticed it and he said, Lisa, you're out there teaching those people. When I go to India, I want you to preach for me. And I preached for him in 1985 in the main sanctuary, and I've been preaching ever since. Amen. So what I realized, what I realized is what, what I thought would disqualify me, God used to catapult me into my destiny. It was like a springboard that God developed to me during that time. And he just springboarded me. He, he, he catapulted me into my destiny. It was in my darkest time that I learned what my gifts were. It was in my darkest time that I learned to pray heaven down. Let me tell you something. You don't know how to pray until you go through the valley. And when you go through the valley, you need to pray every which way you can. And you, you learn to get on your face before the Lord. And you learn to fight the enemy. And you learn to intercede. And you learn what it means to get a hold of God. Amen. During that time, I learned that the Word of God is so alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. During that time, I learned that God is with me and He is for me. And He never, ever forsook me. And He never will. God is with you. Amen. I thought God wanted me to be a pastor's wife, but He wanted me to be a pastor. <laughs> God's plans are always bigger. I had no idea I'd become a pastor. I, I taught and I preached and taught the Word of God. I have for years. And then when my daddy went to heaven, you know, and Joel stepped up to pastor the church, I was so proud of him. And my other brother and I stepped up and are associate pastors there. Little did I know. So you see, we think that God disqual we think we are disqualified by the things we go through. But God doesn't even think that way. God just uses them. And this is the third truth I want to leave with you. Just because you've been wounded doesn't mean you have to live a wounded life. Amen. God is a God of restoration. He heals the brokenhearted. He binds up their wounds. I can tell you something. I've been through a whole lot in my life, and I had not even told you but half what I've been through. But you're looking at one of the happiest people in the world right now. You're looking at somebody who is full of joy, somebody who is fulfilling her destiny. And God, I feel like I'm right smack dab in the middle of my destiny. And I know God has for me, uh, so much more for me. You say, why do you say that, Lisa? Because it's the same for you. You can't see it now, but God has much more for you. You can't see it now, but God is developing your gifts right now. You can't see it now, but you think it's a dark time. But God is saying, I'm just developing them, and I'm making them into a per person of purpose and destiny. God is working in your life. He is directing your steps. God told me one time, he said, people will try to minimize you and criticize you, but God is about to maximize you and supersize you. Let me tell you something. I want to tell you, God is going to maximize you. He is going to supersize you in spite of what you're going through. Amen. The fourth thing I want to mention to you, and this is the last thing, always move forward in life. Always move forward. Did you know that God only has one gear and it's forward? It's not backwards. It's not even reverse. It's not park or neutral. It's forward. Satan wants you to stop dead in your tracks. Satan wants you to go backwards. God wants you to go forward. He takes us from glory to glory to glory to glory. Amen. God is not through with you. And let me tell you something. God is not disappointed in you. God has not disqualified you. God is for you, in you, and with you. Amen. And you may have been knocked down, but it's time to get back up. You know, I think about that scripture that the, though the righteous man or woman falls seven times, she rises again. 
Listen, it's time to rise again. Let, let me say that again because that's so powerful. Though the righteous woman falls seven times, she rises again. God is, ri God is raising you up into a new level of thinking, into a new level of life, into a new level of purpose and destiny. Hallelujah. God is saying, it's time to get back up. It's time for healing. It's time for restoration. It's time to move forward. And I, I just want to, I want to close with a couple of things. In fact, first of all, let me just follow the Holy Spirit. Will you close your eyes just a moment? Let me just have a little ministry time because I feel like the Lord wants me to do a few things and First of all, every eye closed, every head bowed. If you're here tonight and you say, Lisa, I don't have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. If I died tonight, I don't know where I'd spend eternity. I don't have peace with God, but I want to pray the salvation prayer. I want you to raise your hand up and let me see, and then you can put it right back down. Amen. I see those hands. Amen. Anybody else? I'm going to look. I see those hands. Anybody else? I'm looking to my left. You can put your hands down. Thank you so much. If you're here tonight and you say, Lisa, I've known the Lord, but I've been away from him. I've been in sin. And I'm not going to ask you what it is, but you would say, I want to get on, on that prayer because I want to rededicate my life to the Lord. Raise your hand right now. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for your honesty. You can put it back down. So many hands. Let me tell you something. God sees you. He loves you. He accepts you. He adores you. And he brought you here for a purpose. I want you to pray this prayer with all the congregation. Say, oh God, I come to you right now just as I am. I'm a sinner. I'm in need of a Savior. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. Jesus, come into my life. I want you to be my Lord. I want you to be my Savior. I thank you, God, that you've heard my prayer and you've accepted me. You receive me. You adopt me. You approve of me. You have forgiven me. You're now my Heavenly Father. I am your child. Jesus. I am your Lord, uh, you are my Lord and Savior. And I commit on this day that I will serve you all the days of my life. Now listen to this as you pray it. God, set me free of wrong thinking, of addictions, of unforgiveness, bitterness, hurt, Set me free in Jesus' name. Father, I pray for every person that raised their hand. I thank you, Father, that right now they have become a born-again believer, a child of the Most High God. I thank you that right now you have removed their sin from them and you have given, made them new in their spirit. You have given them a new heart with a new start. And Father, I thank you for healing in their lives. In every area of their lives, I thank you for healing and for strength. I pray, Father, that you would help them get connected in a good, strong church, Father, that they would grow in you, Father. I declare over them that from this moment on, I declare this over every one of you, that from this moment on, you are moving forward in your life, and you are coming out in victory in the name of Jesus, and you will fulfill your purpose and destiny in Jesus' name. Now, if you're here tonight and you'd say, Lisa, I am brokenhearted, I am wounded, I'm full of shame, I'm full of hurt, just like you were when you went through that, and I'm ready to get healed, I want you to stand up right now all over this building. Amen. Thank you, Father. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father.